Okay, welcome everyone to this month's um, ICT Micro Talk series. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker, Friedrich Braundorfer from Graz University of Technology. So, Friedrich is an assistant professor at Graz University of Technology since 2014. Before that, he did his PhD in computer science at Graz University of Technology and then moved um, as a postdoc to University of Kentucky, then University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and also ETH Zurich. And from 2012 to 2014, so before he went back to um, Graz University of Technology, he was a deputy director um, of the chair of remote sensing technology at TU Munich. And now he's back in Graz and he's leading a group there. Um, Friedrich's interests are on 3D computer vision and it's used for robotics using um, modern machine learning techniques. And Friedrich is going to talk about AI and computer vision for autonom autonomous drones and robots. Friedrich, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right, then take it from here. Thank you. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for this nice introduction. So my topic today is artificial intelligence, AI, and computer vision for autonomous drones and robots. So this is a very timely topic. Everybody is talking about the impacts of artificial intelligence on technology, economy, and society. And this artificial intelligence techniques will, have, will play an important role in robotics as well. They will allow to make robots more autonomous, more intelligent. So this talk will focus on the role of computer vision techniques for robotics and on the effect of artificial intelligent achievements onto these computer vision techniques. So to start uh, with my presentation, I would like to read you a newspaper headline. So this headline reads as follows. AI computer wraps up 4 to 1 victory against human champion. So this headline refers to a Go game between the world champion, Lee Sedol, and a computer, the AlphaGo system from DeepMind, and the computer won. So this is not from any newspaper. Uh, this is not from the sports sections of the build, but this is from Nature News. So it is considered really important. But this is not an isolated case, actually, not an isolated victory. So in 1996, the chess world champion Kasparov lost against IBM Deep Blue. More recently, in 2011, the IBM Watson played a game of Jeopardy and won against two human competitors. So it's evident that AIs outperform humans in a number of tasks already, and this number of tasks is growing. So when did this start now? And it's quite fascinating that this did not start that long ago. So to show this to you, uh, I've listed three significant uh, milestones in AI research, uh, which led to these events. So on the left side, you can see one particular milestone. So this was published in Nature and 2015, and it's about deep learning. So here a computer was able to classify images to basically tell if there's a cat or a dog in an image or a dangerous melan melanoma. And this was basically a big breakthrough, breakthrough in image processing. Similar at almost the same time, there happened another milestone. A computer learned to play Atari games better than a human could do this. And a little bit Later, we had some achievement uh, where a computer actually learned to play the game of Go uh, by playing against itself, which actually led to this uh, victory over a human Go champion. So these achievements in AI have been significant and they happened over the last years. And of course, this has an impact on economy and society. And to maybe illustrate this impact, I give you some data from a McKinsey study. So there's, it is predicted that the impact on AI on economy can be measured 
in trillions of dollars. So if you can see here, this is one to two trillion of dollars and potential dollar impact in the area of supply chain management and manufacturing. So and why I'm pointing out this area is because this area includes robotics. So manufacturing will be, is done by robotics and will of course uh, use many more robotic technologies in the future. And this has actually a huge impact on economy. So for society, for economy, also these AI developments are really important. So far, I need to confess, I was a little bit sloppy on using the term AI. So when I talk about AI, uh, I typically one means a specific technology of artificial intelligence or machine learning. So like one of the technologies plotted on this chart. So in my case, when I mention AI here, I actually refer to a deep learning technique. And right now, most people also refer to this deep learning technique. So when I talk about AI techniques in my talk, I actually mean uh, modern deep learning techniques using convolutional neural networks, RNNs, or GANs, for instance. So the outline of my talk will now be uh, as follows. So first, I will continue with the introduction to talk a little bit about the role of AI and computer vision algorithms in robotics. And then I will talk about three technical topics, AI and computer vision for eagle motion estimation, AI and computer vision for environment mapping, and AI and computer vision for environment interpretation. To talk about these technical topics and to talk about the role of AI and computer vision and robotics, I think you need to start by characterizing actually a robot first or a robotic system. And this is what I intend to do with this slide. So a robotic system in its most basic form can be characterized by three main capabilities. And these are perception, reasoning, and acting. So for acting, it's quite clear acting is a capability such that the robot can move around and interact physically with an environment. So reasoning is the capability of a robot to uh, plan tasks and perform tasks or tasks on its own. And this is actually the core part of artificial intelligence of a mobile robot. This is also where most of the um, artificial intelligence research goes into robotics. But AI is not only part of this reasoning level, it's also important for perception. So perception is now the capability of a robot to sense the environment. And this is actually what I intend to talk about, because this is where my research in computer vision connects with robotics. This is also where I can show you uh, what influence artificial intelligence technology has in this respect. So to put this into a little bit more detail, uh, I would like to split up this uh, one block of perception into three more distinct techniques. And these are ego motion estimation, environment mapping, and environment interpretation. So this technique for ego motion estimation allows the robot to calculate where it is moving, where its position is. So basically, this is to answer the question, where am I? The second part about environment mapping is about technologies to, to sense the environment, to measure the surroundings. And this is basically to answer the question, what are the things, uh, where are the things around me? And the third part is about interpreting, labeling, and naming parts of the environment. And this is to answer the question, what are the things around me? And these capabilities, these techniques are needed for a mobile robot to make sense of the environment, to pass down this information to the reasoning level and the acting level. So this sensing, this perception is really important for a mobile robot. And this actually will be the main parts of my talk. But before I actually dive into some techniques there and how AI is related to these techniques, 
I would like to show you something else. So in the title of the talk, I promised you robots, I promised you some drones, and I would like to show you some of them now. So when I talk about flying robots, I typically mean a quadruple drone like this. So this is a, a rotocraft, which can fly. To make a robot out of it, we actually added computers and we added sensors. So we don't intend this to pilot this just manually, but this is behaving really like a robot, autonomous, uh, can do path planning, can, sense, can do sensing of the environment. And so for this, we actually added a computer, we added a lot of sensors there. And with these type of flying robots, we actually do a lot of different projects and have prepared one slide which shows you a variety of different projects that we have. So here you can actually see that we developed a drone that avoids uh, stuff thrown at it. So here you can actually see a prototype of, our, of a drone that can deliver mail. Here we have a drone that flies inside that performs inventory in a warehouse. And here you can see one of our drones flying outdoors within a map created on its own, uh, avoiding obstacles and creating safe trajectories around obstacles here. So these are things that we do typically with drones. And to do these projects, to achieve actually tasks like this, we rely on computer vision techniques and we rely on artificial intelligence to sense the environment and give this information to some reasoning level. So after this, I would now like to dive into the first technical topic. And this topic is AI and computer vision for ego motion estimation. So ego motion estimation can be done with a variety of different sensors. So in my talk, I will talk about using cameras, using digital cameras and images to compute ego motion. So this typically, there exists a standard technique for this, and this technique is actually depicted here. It starts by taking a sequence of images, doing some feature extraction, some feature matching, then performing geometry estimation, and that you get an ego motion. You get the poses of the robot, and you get some 3D structure. You can improve this when you use additional measurements, for instance, like IMU data from an inertial measurement unit, which is typically done when you have flying robots. So this is the traditional pipeline. It actually works quite well. You can achieve good results, but at some point, it looks like we reached a limit with this traditional technique. Improving this such that it's more robust, such that it's more accurate, seems to be really hard, but just continuing using these traditional ideas. So this is why people are thinking about different ideas to improve uh, ego motion estimation using cameras. And this is actually where AI technology uh, comes into play. So one of the first ideas to improve this is to skip the step of feature extraction and matching and do a so-called direct approach, direct method. So basically you directly work on the images and do geometry estimation on them. So this uses different algorithms for geometry estimation, and it showed that this can be very fast and uh, quite robust and, and, and more accurate than traditional approaches. So this was actually a very good idea. With the advent of deep learning now, uh, people think about how can we use deep learning in this sense to improve even further. And the, one of the first proposals was to use deep learning directly on the images and create the con convolutional neural network that outputs the motion, the ego motion directly. So this is a very brave attempt, basically skipping all the steps in between. It was shown that it works, but actually so far, none of the approaches that exist, they actually outperform the traditional methods in accuracy and reliability. It's unclear if this is actually the right way of doing it, because here the machine learning methods needs to learn all the geometric relations somehow. Actually, it would 
definitely be beneficial if you could give some of these relations to the network and cooperate it somehow. But just train this from scratch is unclear if this will be the right path of using machine learning in here. So this is why we thought about what else can be done with machine learning in there. And one of the ideas is not to just replace all the steps, but sort of think about individual steps that could be improved using machine learning. And one of the ideas we had there to actually work on this, these parts here to see if we can actually use machine learning to replace this or to change this or to improve this. And here we came up with some uh, visual odometry method that actually replaces these traditional steps by using some machine learning algorithm in there. And I would like to tell you a little bit about this now. So the method that we developed uh, is a visual odometry method based on edges, and we call this Revo. So the idea of what this method, what it can do is it can take two images, one image from here and another from here, and it estimates a rotation and translation between these two. So this method actually needs depth cameras. So it needs, it has an input and image and a depth map. And it is estimating this rotation and translation by trying to align this frame with this frame. And to compute the alignment, not the whole image is considered, but actually edges are considered. This is what you can see here. Edges from one image are projected into the other. And if the transformation is computed correctly, they would perfectly align. So they don't align here because this is before optimization. And after computing the geometry and optimization, you can see you have a perfect alignment. So, so far, this is not using machine learning, but it's clear that the approach heavily depends on these edges that are extracted here. And this is actually where we wanted to add machine learning. So traditional edge detection methods, they don't use machine learning. And we actually were looking into how much can we improve the method by actually learning some meaningful edges precisely for this application. So in the first step, we looked what we actually have already. So we can use very simple methods, traditional methods like a Kenny edge detector. There is an advantage, this one is really fast. So you can actually achieve very high frame rates with this method. There exist also edge detectors that use machine learning, but not deep learning so far. And we also looked into that. And of course, we looked into edge detectors that utilize CNNs, that utilize deep learning. And we, of course, hope that they would actually perform best, give the bad, best uh, results for our application here. So we did a comparison to see uh, what we can expect from these methods. So here we actually looked at edge detection images and images with image blur in it, which is typically challenging. And we can see that the Kenny edge detector creates double representations of edges when we have blurry images, which of course is really bad. So we don't have these problems if we use, if we use uh, machine learning methods, and especially if we actually use blurry images in the training set. So we can actually cope better with uh, motion blur when using machine learned edges here. We also looked into repeatability. Our algorithm requires that we find the same edges in many images from a sequence. So here we plotted the outliers. So how many edges are detected in one frame and not found in the other one. And we can see that the Kenny edge detector has a high peak here. So it frequently finds a lot of edges which we cannot find in the Next one, so this happens due to illumination changes. This happens due to uh, some fast motions, for instance. So the machine learned methods work much better there. But nevertheless, these machine learned methods that we used here, they have been uh, trained for different applications. They have been trained for doing image segmentation. So this is not the precise application that we had in mind. We don't need to nicely delineate objects in an image, but we actually want to have stable, repeatedly detectable edges for our visual odometry application. And this is why we actually took these results and we started to create a training data set to train our own detector on this. 
And for this, we need to get training data. And this is precisely what we can get from our pipeline. So we use traditional edges from a Kenny edge detector or from the other machine learning edge detectors. And then we let them run through our algorithm. And our algorithm actually checks for consistency. It charges the quality of these edges. And only if edges are geometrically consistent and give good results for a post estimation, uh, then we actually put them in a training set. And then we can actually train um, an edge detector with deep learning on this training set, on these training edges. And this is actually what we are currently doing. And here are some preliminary results about this. So what we can see here is we have some images with very strong brightness changes. So it's very bright one, very dark one here, extremely dark one here. Uh, and we can see that with a Kenny edge detector, big parts are totally missed. So this is a very low repeatability. Uh, and these are the ones that we trained with our new training set. And you can see that actually here we have a very high repeatability, even with this very high uh, illumination changes. So this makes the method very robust. And this is actually a behavior that we would like to have for our application, such that we can compute the ego motion from this information in, in strongly varying settings with strong illumination changes with motion blur. So these first results are very promising. We see that we can get good results there. And I think this is a good way to go. We don't change the whole, or we don't replace the whole ego, ego motion estimation with deep learning, not right now, but specific parts where we can find out they can be improved with machine learning. So to close this topic, I would like to show you a video that shows actually our system in work. So what we have right now is we have a, a small program uh, which runs on the CPU. So it does not need actually a big GPU for letting it run. Uh, and it runs with a depth camera. And actually, it's available for download. So if you're interested in testing this, you can download it from the GitHub repository of Fabian Cheng, the PhD student who was working on this. And what you get is basically a visual geometry or SLAM system that produces camera poses and a sparse 3D reconstruction uh, given a depth image and a RGB image as an input. And here you can see how it works. It, when you go along with the camera, it will compute its pose and it will create 3D measurement on its way. And this is actually what we need for a mobile robot, the ego motion estimation, such that we can keep track of the position of where the robot will be moving. So this basically closes the first technical topic I wanted to talk about. Now I would like to continue with the second topic, AI and computer vision for environment, environment mapping. So a robot to work, to roam the environment, needs a 3D environment map, such a map that you can see here on the slide. So this map encodes obstacles. They are color encoded. Blue means the, the, height, the height of it is low, and this is a, a very tall obstacle. And the robot can basically perform path planning between these obstacles and move around. So if you have such a 3D map, you actually can do navigation. You can do path planning for a robot. You can do something. So this environment map can be computed from image data. So you can do this. Uh, with a typical structure for motion pipeline. So this is quite complicated. It's quite similar to the visual geometry that I had before, but with a little bit uh, more steps because you can typically do this in post-processing. So in, similar to the previous one, we are looking into machine learning techniques that can improve this pipeline by actually replacing some parts in it or changing some parts where we can actually think that machine learning makes sense. And one of these ideas is to actually compute distances, depth estimation, not in the traditional way, but with machine learning, to use uh, single image depth estimation. So what you can do with this, you can actually compute a depth map. So these are distances from a single image. So traditional geometric uh, estimation needs at least two images or more than two to do this. 
with deep learning, you can actually train a system to do this from a single image. And this is something like that works like magic. So this is really very interesting. And this of course changes a lot and it would be very useful to use these techniques. But to use these techniques in robotics, you need to make sure that the results are correct. And so we also need to think about, are these results correct? Does this method work precise and accurately? And this is, this is the topic of one of our studies. And I would like to give you a little bit of results on this. So to, when you look into the papers, most authors just state and compare pixel differences in the depth maps, and they are quite low. So the results are quite promising. But actually, we also were interested in how is the geometry there? Is the geometry reconstructed correctly? If we have a, a planar tabletop, is this a plane or is it deviating from a plane? Are walls straight, for instance? So and to check this, uh, we actually created a data set where we have some very precise ground truth. So this is what you can see here as an example. And we did a lot of evaluations. So we basically tested eight state-of-the-art methods on our data set. And we actually looked into the standard metrics that are used so far. And they are typically very, and on this with using the standard metrics, the results are working very well. So the methods have low error. So this is quite good. But when we actually looked into our geometric errors that we proposed, we found that there are some annoying differences and annoying problems. For instance, here in this test, we looked for planarity. We computed the correct plane parameters here of this wall and also of this tabletop. And here in these plots, you can see the deviations from the actual plane. So these colors means that here you have after 20 centimeter height distance, to the positive direction here to the negative direction. Also here, so the angles in which this object are represented, recreated, they are quite off and in very different ways. So here it's almost random how this is distributed. So if you have robots and you actually want to measure uh, if your floor is inclined or not, then you will get totally different uh, results with these methods here. And all of them are also wrong. So this would not happen if you use, for instance, a stereo system, if you use two images. But if you use uh, the CNN system from a single image, you actually need to cope with such, with such errors here. And this can be problematic. So if one wants to use this method, you need to be sure that they are used in, in a step where this actually does not matter that much. Now, this actually is a very interesting finding of our result. And we also explored the limits of the single image depth estimation method. And there is a very interesting uh, behavior. So if you actually put the picture on the flat wall that shows a 3D scene, we can fool the neural network. So it actually believes that there's an opening in the wall with the 3D scene in the back. And this, of course, is really problematic if you want to use this in robotics. So basically, the wall is not visible. The system believes it just continues into the 3D scene. And of course, this is uh, quite some complication. But now, nevertheless, these methods can be used in different steps of a pipeline. Uh, and you need to be aware of uh, these problems. And maybe in the future, with more training data, one can also get rid of these problems here. So to continue with the uh, topic about mapping, I would like to show you a little an application that we develop that basically uh, has to do with the drones. So if you use drones, most of the time you want to take pictures from above to create a 3D model from above. For instance, if you have here, you would like to create a 3D model of this building. This can be perfectly done with a drone. You need to fly a drone around this building and take some pictures here. And then you can actually do some very nice 3D modeling. Um, if you want to do this right now, most people actually need to pilot the drone themselves. And while you pilot, you need to make sure that you get good pictures and you actually need to make sure that you don't fly into an obstacle, that you don't crash into a tree or something like this. And for this, you need to be a very well-trained pilot. So we actually worked on a system 
that does this automatically, such that an untrained person can actually uh, take the proper picture to create such a 3D model. And this is actually done by some automatic system that takes as an input some overview map. So first you fly up with a drone high up at altitude, take one or two pictures there and compute the depth map and the semantic interpretation map from there. So this depth map actually can be computed from a couple of images or here in this case, you can use the single image depth estimation methods that I talked about earlier. And based on this information now, we have a system that can compute the optimal positions for cameras, that how they should be placed around this building to take uh, a very accurate, precise, and complete 3D reconstruction. Uh, and this is then sent to the drone, and the drone performs this. And this actually will allow the drone to avoid all the objects that are in this map here. And it will also allow the the drone to avoid restricted areas. If for instance, you see people in here in the semantic map or cars, the drone can be programmed to don't to not fly over cars for a case that there's a mail function and it would fall down, for instance. So such an automatic uh, flight plan would look like this. So this would be such a, a flight plan. So you see, this is not a flight plan that the human would do, not a simple circuit. It would go down to get some better pictures from the bottom here. It would uh, try to not fly directly over the street here. It would avoid these trees over here, but also take pictures that are perfectly suited uh, to take a complete and accurate 3D reconstruction. And you actually can see the effect of this if you do some comparisons. So here we actually have a 3D model created with this technique. This is here, and this is one that is cre created from images that were just took manually, but just flying a circle around this. What you can see here is that there are artifacts in the manual method, and in our optimized method, these artifacts are gone. So this actually makes a lot of sense then. And here you can actually see uh, an evaluation of the overall accuracy. As com so here you can see that compared to ground truth, this method actually has errors in the area from three to four centimeters, most of them. And here actually we lowered these errors into the air area of zero to two centimeters. So even here, so even in precision, we gain a lot by doing the, by using the optimal positions for taking the images here. And for this, we actually, so we, we need the information from machine learning techniques. We need the semantic interpretation. We also need the depth estimation here. So this is a very nice application that shows how actually uh, computer vision and artificial intelligence influence robotics. Okay, I'm now done with this uh, second topic. I would not like to come to the last and the third topic here. And this is AI and computer vision for environment interpretation. So this is about to answer the questions, what are the things around me? This means put labels and names and semantic information into environment maps. So this is an example for this here. This is a 3D reconstruction where the colors represent labels, names. So this green color represents grass. This dark green represents woods. This is a road. And these lines here are power cables. And we also have some color here for the, for the structures. So basically, the elements in the objects got different names. And this is one of the core applications for machine learning to interpret image to extract semantic information from image data. And there exists a lot of work on this. And most techniques rely on convolutional neural networks to perform uh, image classification and to actually then come up with some semantic interpretation of an image. And this, of course, allows a lot of things. In robotics, this would allow smart decisions when to avoid obstacles. If you have humans in 
your field of view, then of course you would like to have a, to leave a larger safety distance, for instance. So what I would like to talk now is to talk about one specific idea and the effect of this idea on the quality of this semantic interpretation. So this would be the use of a conditional random field after some standard convolutional neural network for semantic labeling. So here you have depicted an input image, a CNN, and this CNN produces an output. So this is a typically a fully convolutional neural network and it produces some very nice output. We now suggest that what we did actually in our work and we followed also some other things, we added an additional step, a conditional random field at the end, which takes this label map as an input, but also the original input image. And then it compares if these label boundaries here are consistent with edges in this image. And if, for instance, some details are lost, they can be added in by this step. And we could see that this effect is quite enormous and a lot of details are actually lost here and they can be put back with this step here. And it's actually very nice that this CRF can be also written as an RNN and it can be basically added to the whole convolutional neural network and also for training. So this is a very nice idea and this is a very successful idea and I just wanted to convey this message that if you are unhappy with the quality of your segmentation, then you should try if you can use a CIF but if this gives you back some details. So it worked very well in our case. And here's an example. So this would be an output of the, of the raw neural network. And after the CIF refinement, we can get back all these small details what we have from the power pylon here. So, and this is really a big improvement much more detail, uh, which is very valuable. So this is basically the message I wanted to tell you about this. Uh, if you need detail, you could try also adding a conditional random field at the end. So about segmentic segmentation, you need training data. Uh, there's a lot of training data available. And I also wanted to uh, highlight that we also created a training data from drone images. So we were flying with a drone over uh, buildings and we were actually collecting data there and we were labeling this data. So we created this semantic drone data set that if you're interested in training uh, some neural network, you can actually use our data for this and you can download this at drone data set.icg.geocrats.at. So this was one topic. Uh, doing semantic segmentation on drone images outdoors, but we're also looking into indoors operations. So many robots will work indoors in households and there the scenario is different. So uh, this is also, we need to think about how to do semantic uh, labeling indoors and indoors we can do more. We can look also at other things. We can also think about uh, finding outlines of rooms, which is very important for robotics, not just naming objects, but actually doing more. So this is actually what you can see here. This is the uh, results of one of our recent works. So if we get an image like this, we would like to find out the outlines of the room. This would be important for a robot to do path planning. We would like to know that this is, for instance, the floor, that these are the walls, and that this wall ends here. And our idea was to use machine learning to do this on a single image. So the standard way of doing such outline generation is to create a 3D reconstruction, uh, have a big point cloud, segment this point cloud into planes and then come out with this outline. In our case, we were looking into the topic, can we use a single image and machine learning techniques to actually come up with this outline? For instance, finding out the outlines of the floor. This would be basically the floor plan of the building, then also delineating the walls, this wall and this wall. And this should also work for cases where all these walls are, are hidden, for instance, by furniture, as you can see here. 
So here we see the furniture, but we actually want the outline of this wall, for instance, like this here. We want also to know that there's an edge and the floor is actually, this would be the floor plan of these rooms in here. And the, it's really fascinating that this, this, this can be done uh, with machine learning techniques, with deep learning and convolutional neural networks. And we can get results by giving just a single image. We can actually get such a very nice 3D rendering of it just by processing this one single image here. And this, of course, is important for robotics. If you have this, you can map the environment. You know where certain furniture is, where there's free space to roam around, where you have obstacles here. So how does this method work? So I have only two slides on this. I'm not going into detail. Uh, but we have an input image. Then we can do a segmentation into classes. We are interested mainly in floor and, and walls and ceilings. And we classify all the furniture as clutter. And then we do another CNN that tells us where we find planar regions, like the floor, like the, the walls, and also get the geometry of it, like depth and plane parameters. So we can get this actually from uh, the idea of plane RCNN. And by combining this, combining this information, we can label these planes with meaning, and then we can actually uh, do some in inference on all the planes that we have. We can do some uh, 3D plane inference, intersection of planes to get all these possible layouts and polygons. And then we actually can filter out the right polygon that fits best to our input image. And if we have this and the planes parameters, we actually have not just a layout in 2D, but we have the 3D layout of it. And we can actually create a 3D rendering of it. But the important part, the machine learning actually happens here in this step, where we do semantic segmentation, where we do actually the planar region detection and the combination of them. And this allows us to actually work uh, on many different scenarios. We can use single images, compute the 3D layouts from the single images. And this method is also able to filter out furnitures. So this is actually a very fascinating technique, I think. So I'm now coming to the end of my presentation. I have uh, two more slides left that I would like to show. When we talk about robotics, we want to have mobile robots. So this means they don't have a very strong computer, a lot of processing power. They need embedded computers. So all these techniques are needed, but we need them on board of a robot. So we're also looking into the area, can we actually put these AI techniques on embedded uh, systems. And this is actually possible. They are dedicated processors which allow the integration of deep learning onto small scale systems. So here you can actually see one of our prototypes. Here is a Movidius compute stick, which is a neural processor. And this is actually a Raspberry Pi with a camera. And basically, what we created here is a variable object detector. So we can take some picture here and on board in real time, this neural process is actually running uh, neural networks to do object detection. The results look, for instance, like this. Uh, we have an object detector implemented, and this is one output of this small box. Uh, it detects people, it detects cars, it detects certain other objects which are not in the image right now. And this can be done in such a small form factor. So it is really possible to use all these modern AI techniques, the deep learning techniques, also in robotics on small scale robots, even on our flying drones, which have to be small and lightweight. Okay, so now I'm at the end of my talk and I would like to summarize uh, this talk with four final statements. So AI and machine learning can overcome limitations of traditional computer vision. So this is quite evident. Artificial intelligence methods replace handcrafted algorithms with machine learned methods. You could have seen this in the edges. So this is really a very uh, important behavior. 
We can also see that deep learning outperforms traditional machine learning when we look at segmentation and image interpretation. And we can also see that AI allows us to solve previously impossible tasks, like for instance, estimating the room layout from single images, which is quite fascinating. Okay, so this now closes uh, my talk and I would be happy if you have some questions. Thank you for this interesting talk. We have time for questions. I'm sure Oliver has some, but maybe someone else wants to start. To have yeah. a question. Sure. Uh, can, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear well. Uh, okay. So I would be interested in this uh, edge detection and edge matching stuff. You said you created the data set and then you trained this, I think, fully convolutional network to match the edges, right? But why can't you use uh, the, the classical algorithm you used for creating the training set? So, so why do you need uh, a, a machine learning model uh, in the first place? Be because your model can only be as good as your training data, right? And, and if you can create this, this data in your classical algorithms, uh, why uh, can't you use this instead? Okay, I think I understand what you're referring to. So we, we don't learn the matching of the edges with the neural network, but the detection. So this matching is uh, geometric matching. So the reason why we use our system is because the detection of the edges is one part, and then we have some geometric reasoning that filters out wrong or bad edges that are not useful. With this geometric reasoning, we can create this training data set. Ideally, we would like to have on detected only edges that are fully consistent with the geometric algorithms because they don't create processing overhead. And this is actually why we can create the training set with our pipeline because this pipeline performs some geometric reasoning. It shows if these edges can be matched. It shows if these edges are useful, if the edges are on depth discontinuities, for instance, they are not very useful. They have to be discarded during the further processing. And our, and our training set that is created is basically the remaining edges that fulfill all the criteria. And so far, there doesn't exist a data set with these edges. And this is what we create. And we want to learn uh, certain, we want to learn precisely a detector that only detects these edges that would be the outliers of our system or the, the in-layers to our system, the ones that will survive all the screening processes. So it's just a filtering process, more or less, to, to filter out the important edges for speed up reasons. Yes, because if you detect many edges in the beginning, the system needs to get rid of many edges, which takes a lot of time. And this also can actually break down the algorithm. So ideally, you only would like to have detections that are sure to survive. Okay. And it gives the best accuracy also. Thank and you. it's actually unclear uh, which properties this have to have. We only notice at the end of the system when the camera poses are precise, precisely calculated, then we know that these edges are good. And then we keep them. Thank you. Further questions? Yes. Um, I have a question for the flight path planning and also like by finding out your own motion as a drone. Um, if you are outside, for example, and uh, the drone is um, moving where you also have other moving actors like truck, um, I think that you also need like uh, not only the environment, environment mapping and uh, this uh, eagle motion estimation, but also like the interpretation. So you know that this is a moving object, right? And not a tree or a building that is static. So I have a little bit problems understanding you. So the quality wasn't so good. So there was some 
some missing parts in there. So I'm not so sure, I, I did not fully understand what your question was. I can summarize that quickly. How do you deal with moving objects in a scene where you do environment detection? Um, how, how do you deal with the truck, for instance? Do you need to, do you need to handle that differently uh, in, in the context of car play? And in the context, uh, in which context of? <laughs> Sorry, it did not go through. In the context of path planning. Path planning. Okay, so there was uh, this path was missing. Okay. <laughs> yes. So in this context, I'm already here. So what you so basically in right now we have this overview map that gives this uh, that computes this optimal trajectory based on the on the static map. If they are moving objects in there, they are not registered. So what you need to do is you need to actually consider uh, some obstacle detection on the drone that maybe stops in front of an object that was not there before. So this is what one can do. But updating this path is complicated, but, I've, but it can be done. So right now, this is a global optimization. So what you need to do is if you actually cannot go somewhere because a new object, a dynamic obstacle appeared, then we actually need to do a complete replanning of the path, but starting from this position. This would be possible, but of course here it would be nice to have some easy ability to update the path. Right now, this is not possible. Okay, thank you. Other questions, Oliver? Yeah, Friedrich, I'm in the blind spot of the camera. You can't see me. <laughs> that was a really great talk and, of course, really great work. Um, but my, my question is, is also regarding the training data. Every time I think about really working with deep learning stuff, it's always about the training data, where things start to fail. Um, how representative is your training data that you use? I guess you use, you produce training data from depth information, either using a depth sensor or renderings, or you have a three model. And I guess for the semantic labeling, you have some manual labels. I think you produce the data using the manual labeling, I guess. How representative is this for making your techniques work in general, or do they work only for selected um, cases? Okay, uh, again, it's it's hard to, to understand you. Somehow the connection doesn't work very well in this direction. Um, so I think you were asking about the representation of the training data and the data sets. So it's, it's really important that you have big data sets when you do deep learning. And it works very well when you have data, when you have then, when you work on data that is similar. So, so it's, the best results you get when you actually have a huge amount of, of training data. It's actually interesting that even with smallest data sets, you actually get good results, but then you can easily see that if you go to new scenes, some things will not work well. For, for, for semantic segmentation, uh, what we can see is that if we go into indoor scenarios and we actually have a cup, have 10,000 images from indoor scenarios, we can actually cover already a lot. If you think about some analysis like uh, person detection and, and the face detection, actually, I think you are already there. So we, there are data sets around that basically allow to do this with a very uh, high reliability. But if you, but clearly the segmentation task, especially if you have some objects that don't appear often or that have a low, a high variability, so they typically will not work very well if you only have a few images of them. So this is actually where huge data sets come in or maybe some other techniques that work better with less data. And that's clear, but regarding your um, semantic labeling example, for example, do you produce the training data set by manual labeling or do you take existing data sets that are labeled already? So when I think about your power line detection, these kind of things, do you do that by yourself or do you have access to existing labeled data sets? So with the semantic 
labels. So from the, the this aerial images, we created a label data set there. Okay. So we did this manually and we actually had high resolution images and we did not need that many there. So we have this data set and this worked very well. For this, for this, the larger drone data set, we did also some manual labeling and this labeling was cross-checked. So this was done by, done by labeling the same scenes multiple times. So there we have around 400 images of high, re high resolution label data. So this is what you can actually download and you can learn very nice models from this. But this manual labeling is problematic but for semantics, we can actually do not really do this in an, mod, in an automatic way. But with the edges, we actually did not want to do this manually. So there we really thought we need to create this training sets automatically. And there we actually found by using geometric relations, we found a way to create this training data automatically. And we can therefore process new data and automatically create new training data, which, which of course is very nice. Do you also do a lot of augmentation? Yes, there's data augmentation is in there, and this is very useful. I have a follow-up question regarding the label splitting. Um, so there are manually labels, um, and where do you take the labels from? Do you have a vocabulary of labels? Do you define that beforehand for the context um, like of the data you want to use? Because you, you have hierarchical relationships also. You have a tree that is also nature. You have other parts in the nature. How do you how do you deal with that uh, in, in the context of your uh, public data sets that you put on your website for others to use? So how did you pick the labels? Well, there we typically follow some other data sets that are around. And then we also restrict this to certain applications. So we don't go into total details. So we, if you look at the cityscapes data set, you have a list of labels which are used in the automotive driving area. And these are the ones that we also try to follow for our labeling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Further questions, Andreas? I have a question on uh, the edges. Uh, uh, how, how do you measure an, an error there? Yeah, so uh, how, how do you uh, define an error metric for, for, for edges that you find? And uh, maybe related to this, uh, uh, how are the edges uh, represented? Is it represented as pixels in a 2D or 3D space, or uh, does it have some other representation? Okay, first, I, and we need to leave the room here. So I, I will answer this question, but then actually we need to we need to stop. <laughs> I'm sorry about this <laughs> uh, because a lecture is waiting here. So the the error metric for the edges is that it's a geometric error measure in pixels. So what we do is if we have a su successful alignment of edges, we estimate a camera position, we can, uh, we can project one edge map into the other one, and then we can measure the differences between these, the distances between these edge maps in pixels. And this is, this is what we do by distance transform between these two edge maps. And so the error is geometric and it's in pixels. So this is, this is a good idea because finding a descriptor for edges is complicated. And I'm not sure if there exist solutions that really work very well. So it's a geometric error. Okay, Friedrich, then uh, we let you off the hook to empty the room. Thanks again for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, thanks again. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we, we're going to have uh, a break in February because the semester uh, is over and we're waiting for the next semester to start. We're going to have the next talk in March. Uh, and Thank you. And it will be announced via email um, in due time. Thank you very much.